started. So welcome everyone to um, our breakout session today on tiny ML in smart home and buildings. We want to inspire you with you know what's happening with this technology when it you know the rubber hits the road or the rubber hits the living room carpet might be a better term. Um, what is this going to enable when you make use of tiny ML? What are some of the exciting things? Um, and I love Stacy to introduce herself to our, our guest today. Hello, y'all. My name is Stacey Higginbotham. I am a journalist and podcaster. I cover the Internet of Things and I have for, oh my gosh, almost a decade now. Um, I do a show called the Internet of Things podcast and I am I have a site and a newsletter on StaceyOnIoT.com. So this is not about marketing me, but this is, you know, just to give you a perspective, I is I've been covering technology for 20 years. I started out as a chip reporter. So things like lithography and manufacturing were like my jam way back then. So this is like the combination of all my interests coming together. Um, so that's who I am. And Zach, do you want to do your introduce yourself too? Or Happy to. So hi everyone. My name is Zach Shelby. I am one of the board of director members for the Tiny Mouth Foundation. So I'm here um, on behalf of the Tiny ML Foundation to help organize this breakout and talk to you about applications in the market. I'm also the co-founder and CEO of Edge Impulse, so got some experience in what kind of applications people are really working on in the developer community and in the enterprise community. And I'll help share some of that, that experience with all. Okay, so do you want me to start with like things I'm thinking about? Okay. so. Yeah. I am not the nerdy machine learning expert that Zach is. <laughs> I am just a person who likes to play around with devices. So I am really excited about the opportunities that edge machine learning in tiny ML as it is can offer because there's so many privacy benefits to not bringing stuff out to the internet. They're actually power benefits. So I can think about doing more on a battery powered or constrained device uh, that just is much more compelling and gives me a better user experience. And uh, there's, there's also entirely new experiences that I can have that mean I don't have to download an app or have these kind of clunky user experiences. I don't know about you, but like I have a hundred apps on my phone and some of them are dumb. They're like apps to like, turn on a single light bulb. So when I look at what machine learning can offer, I, I'm looking at things that can provide privacy focused security systems, for example. So a really great example that I had, this isn't tiny, but this is machine learning on an edge device, is I used to have the NetAtmo welcome camera and we trained it on the faces in my house. and. Once we had trained the camera, when it saw us, or actually when it didn't see us after a certain period of time, it was like, oh, they must not be home. And it would actually rig the alarm system. I did nothing. Nothing went out to the internet, which made me feel secure letting my like six-year-old get her face trained on that. So those kind of things are really exciting to me. And then some of the other things I think of are um, a faster response time associated with like turning on a light or even the ability to just say, hey, you know, turn on table side lamp. And that happens because there is something on the lamp that recognizes that, not that it has to go all the way out to the cloud and talk to something. Um, and when I when I classify these devices, I, I try to think of like why it why tiny ML would make sense in a smart home device. And I kind of classify them as like, oh, that faster response time. I think about sensors and actuation in a closed system. So like maybe it's a smart or maybe it's measuring my air quality and talking to sensors, talking to my HVAC locally um, and in controlling that for fresh air, whatever. Um, I think about single purpose devices and, and sensor fusion. So a, a fun single purpose device that I've I've liked, but I never liked that I that I've liked, but I would like it to be smart on its own is there was a company called Lumo that made a posture sensor and it would tell you like if it would send you a notification on your phone and it would say like sit up straight. 
that sort of thing should never have to go through my phone. Um, so, so those kind of devices. And then, uh, you know, again, anything that needs energy savings or battery. And I know, uh, Zach, you're going to talk about like the healthcare stuff and that, that touches on a lot of these things. It's might be a closed system. It might need a fast response time. Privacy is going to be crucial. They're all battery powered. So we'll start digging into these, but those are kind of the big, the big categories I think of. You know, and, and the one thing I'd add to that is um, user experience, right? Like you were kind of touching on that with the closed loop thing and not having to um, add an app on your phone. But with the with the ubiquitous deployment of human voice as an interface to the world of shopping is what I'll call it, the, the, the Alexas and series of the world, um, that of course goes to the internet. There is a little bit of wake word in there, right, to detect your 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 keyword and, and turn on the device, but the rest of it goes to the internet. But I think that's opened up um, voice as an interface that people are comfortable with more widely. And the beautiful thing about TinyML is we can bring more of that voice control, um, like the company that Chris Rowan founded, Babel Labs, acquired by Cisco. They were doing exactly that: voice commands, um, even more complicated voice commands, right on device. And that just opens up a whole world of possibilities for local control of things, right? That never have to go to the internet, don't have to go to your app. You know, you might train it once on your voice, for example, and then it just does what it's supposed to for you, like open the door or, um, you know, unclog the drain or scratch my back with the, <laughs> the automated back scratcher. So a whole bunch of things you could do with simple voice commands. Um, we've seen something, we've seen a lot of activity on that with Chinese email tools. So it's, an indication that there is a lot of interest in voice interfaces, but I'd say that sensors are getting more interesting too. We're, we're even seeing applications in like radar-based gesture controls where you're using radar as a short range way of understanding human gestures without touching something or without having to speak. And I think that's really fascinating as a, as a new way of, of improving user interfaces. So radar, so when we think of the smart home, one of the biggest challenges is there's not enough context. Nothing taught, mm. it's because things don't talk to each other and it's because we don't talk to it. It's always our phone. And so for people that don't have phones or people that don't carry their phones like myself, it, the home has no clue what's going on. And so this is a great era or area for that. So things like radar, or ultra wideband, uh, that gives you fine grained location in a room of an individual and having that be on like a wearable or something that's a little less clunky than a phone or just intrusive would be a game changer for the smart home. So, and again, that, that kind of gets into this like closed system and it's also privacy. Like people are going to care. Like, I don't want Google to know that I'm, you know, spending this much time in the bathroom or something, right? <laughs> I, I want that to stay in the bathroom. Um, so that's that's too, that's a big deal. And then you mm. layer voice or something onto that. And then I'll just throw out, just because this is futuristic, but I think it's so compelling, is using something like gaze as an indication that I'm interested mm. in a device and then layering voice. So uh, my favorite example is my my stove right so saying something like uh turn on the burner that's a voice command but it also needs to know which burner i'm talking about and just being able to like you're not right talking burner. about the burner phone that you've got it's not the yes. burner phone it's the it's the stove burner it, this could be misunderstood <laughs> it, it is true so so things like that get really interesting when we start thinking like hey turn on the lamp and if i'm looking at this lamp or gesturing and that that doesn't ever need to go out to the internet because that would be so expensive for such a small use case. That's a really good point. So making sure that you can interact with devices with the right context. And I, I think that could open up a lot of really interesting machine learning applications, maybe not just right on the device itself. Like we've talked about voice interfaces or radars or even gaze, but there are companies out there that are doing longer range radar technologies, for example, which allow you to understand the context of what's happening in a whole room all at once. Mm -hmm. And that could be really interesting, maybe adding that context of room usage, room movement, who, who is where, what are they doing, but without actually knowing who they are 
particular, right? With a little right. more privacy on, even on that. And there's that's where some sensors are really great because they are kind of naturally privacy centric. You can't actually see who somebody is. You can just see that there is a there is a moving thing right at this area of the room, sitting down on the couch, for example. You can tell that. Um, thermal camera technologies. There's also event based cameras that are doing interesting things with moving pixels. So you can't actually see static pixels, only moving pixels. So so context more broadly. Um, I don't think gaze detection is all that far out actually on on kind of the low end of cortex A and even maybe in the future with kind of accelerated cortex M. We can start to do things like gaze detection and, and just gaze focus, right? Is the user focused on me? The, me, me is the object, right? The light switch or the lamp <laughs> um, versus, you know, distracted by something else. Telling that um, could come in the world of pretty low power devices in the next couple of years. We see, a, I, I don't know if it's really gaze detection that it's being used at, but like, I, I know that I have like a, a Google display that it's, it's actually using, I believe, a PIR sensor and it, it it expands the user interface. It makes it bigger if I'm farther away. So it understands where I am in the room and reacts to that and adjusts to that kind of, in in those kinds of, those are not make or break for products, right? You're not going to buy a product because of it, does it? It's it's kind of that delightful experience, and I think that gets to kind of the challenge of putting ML into some of these things. Is it's it's going to be on premium products first, mm -hmm. and it's going to be in the service of creating these kind of experiences that get people excited about their mm -hmm. their washing machine, which they probably never have been excited about before. So that is something to kind of, it's a caveat, I guess. Yeah, so we are talking probably about the high end of the, the home market, right? The, the people that are not just selling a product, they're selling a product with an experience, maybe with a service that does something more. And I, I'd agree with that. I think that's where we're gonna see the effort and time put in to the R&D that it requires to integrate tiny amount of technology into products. Um, I think something else that we're gonna see eventually is, um. Personalization, I think that's something really interesting about um, machine learning technology in general in product development is that we for so long created kind of static algorithms. When we code things and engineer a feature into a product, it's kind of like, great, that's there. It's for everyone, right? It's, it's the product feature that everyone uses in the same way. You might have a few switches to configure it. But what data lets us do is really personalize. We can create you know, whole layers of different sets of data. It might be the, the general set of data about voice or about gestures, or but even we've seen things like capacitive touch on faucets, for example. That's a real tiny amount of use case to configure how you touch the faucet, right? And even how a different faucet reacts to touch, um, enabling us to train our things, right? Like we train our pets good faucet, I want to touch you over here faucet when I want on, bad faucet, no, this is not what I want, right? Me as the user, and then having the faucet learn the right ways to do this, kind of like face detection on our phones these days, we're kind of training the face detection to detect my phone, which doesn't work with masks or sunglasses, and that's not, not great, we can improve that. Um, what do you think about personalization? So I think a great, people feel like it's so far, it feels like it's so far away, but a good, example is actually in, in your car. I don't, I have a, I have a Tesla and you know, when you get in it, you program it to like, you, you set every, in everybody's car, or not everybody's, many cars today have that ability where you, you set everything up and you hit a button and you memorize that setting, right? And it's like, when you get in the car, it, it might recognize who you are. That's something that could be very easily done, like based on maybe weight or facial detection. And so I, right now I push a button, but when I push that button, all these pre-programmatic things come into place. And we do that and accept that in a car. I think going forward, we'll start doing that for our homes and maybe our offices, like places that we, where it's worth the time to like create those programs. And they may be as simple as like, I like this kind of temperature in the room. I, you know, I think about someone who has like a, a small child. If you can imagine like personalizing the home to be a little bit better for them, maybe it's like certain, like the nightlight goes on in their room or things like that, you know, could, could happen in response to their needs. 
that's really exciting. And I think we'll get there. That is going to take a coordination. Actually, localized ML would mean you wouldn't have as much coordination. So if you could put that in the devices, you would still need to build it into some sort of smart home orchestration software, though. But it would still be helpful, and it could all still stay local. Yeah, you could maybe at least distribute some of the control so it's not as dependent on the app, for example. And, and we have one question from the audience that I think kind of yeah. kind of um, falls into this this as well. So, um, from Zoltan, um, what's your view on local point to point or grid networking of IoT devices? Um, you know, for example, three plus microcontrollers with mics placed in the living room could position people or computer vision could coordinate maybe with another product, kind of like what you're saying, that we might need to be a little bit of orchestration. How does point to point, like peer to peer networking play into that? So for the longest time, we've been very focused on like wireless standards. So everything can talk to each other. And we haven't been as focused on like data models and frameworks for the devices themselves. And I think I'm very excited about something called Project Connected Home over IP because that, will let, okay, theoretically, <laughs> that will provide common uh, models for the devices. So I'm a light bulb, I have the following characteristics, or I'm a television, I have the following characteristics and commands that can control me. And now it standardizes it so these things can work together even from different manufacturers. I, I am a big proponent of maybe each room having a controller that is is the brains of a room that talks back to the home itself and maybe not not every room will have one but like think of like a, a smart display or something like that and that's going to have a lot more computing power and handle the computation that needs to happen not everything will have to go back to that and then if you're talking about actual networks thread is the underlying protocol that people are kind of voting with their their products with right now for the smart home um, and it is it's a very nice robust protocol for that i was part of um designing that protocol in my past life i started oh. working with the thread group when it was first formed when it was part of nest before right people, right um and when i was an arm i i agree i think that's a really exciting development to see people not only kind of starting to use open standards for this, but also some layering of of models, right? And, and connected project connected home over IP, I think is a great example of that. I put that in the list. I put that in the chat for people if they want to go take a look. And that's just about, you know, enabling kind of this layered openness, right? If you want to have open data models between things, even on different networks, the beautiful thing about internet protocols is it helps you connect those things together in an independent way. You can still have a common language without having to share the same protocol. Not everything has to be BLE, for example, or Wi-Fi. You could have something on a Wi-Fi network, something on BLE. And that's important for TinyML too, like from this question too, we, we may need to have some coordination between these things. We may wanna know the context of the room. Uh, is there someone on the couch together with a voice command, for example, might mean something very different to someone who is not in that room and you hear the same voice command, right? That might right. have a completely different context. So some of that context from TinyML at a room level plus TinyML at a device level could have a big implication. So that 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 developments in networking and data models is a really interesting, interesting area. And I would say for people, people position tracking, I hate computer vision. I truly do. I I do not want and, and I think most people have an issue, many people have an issue with cameras in their home. And I think, you know, if you look at radar, that's a really awesome opportunity. There's uh, Google has Soli, which is fine grained. Uh, in industrial setting, there's Fira, which also for like cobot settings. Um, Apple has ultra wideband, their UWB1 chip. And then you've got bigger radar or so bigger radar would be like a Vire is a Israeli company that does that um, or like cognitive systems or Linksys has a technology that uses RF interference from Wi-Fi that is that has like a higher false positive rate for 
like figuring out like what a person is actually doing, but it's a really nice blunt tool and you could use that to trigger something else to turn on kind of like you use like ML on a device to be like, oh, is that a face? Let's wake up the smarter processor. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so understanding context without necessarily taking pictures of you. I, I kind yes. of feel the same way. I don't, I don't like um, cameras around everywhere and I don't even like these um, internet connected voice interfaces. I don't have an Alexa at my home. I refuse because I'm not too comfortable with the privacy of that. I don't really want all the sound from my home going everywhere. I'm talking to customers, for example, and those are private discussions. I don't want to accidentally have that picked up um, on the internet. So, so it, 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 there is a lot to be said about privacy and also how people are comfortable with what's in their home right? and what it does for them. So, so I am. Um, I think what we should do is I'd love to dive into a little bit about the market, what's happening with some applications that we're seeing, like what are our customers really asking for? I think it will help many people on the call who are engineers or companies working in the space to think about where to put their effort. Um, and I'd love to talk about one case that we worked on in the wearable health space and what that might mean for kind of the future of wearable health on you and your home. I think that's going to become really, really interesting. Um, so I'm going to show, I'm going to be very brave and I'm going to share a slide. <clears throat> Can everyone see that? Yes. Perfect. Okay. So, um, late last year, um, with our team at Edge Impulse, we did a little bit of a data, um, analysis job. We, we took the top 60 customer opportunities that we've seen, people that come and want to work with machine lear learning technology on embedded systems. And what are the application types, sensor types? What are the industries that they're in? And try to use that to kind of look at what are the top areas of applications and industries that, we, that we're going to run across. And the result of that data analysis was really interesting. These are the top three application types that we see and it turns out it's not actually so much about the market segment it isn't about like industrial versus consumer as much as it is about the type of thing we're trying to solve with machine learning that's the common denominator and to some extent the type of sensors that we, we see um, and so the the top three things and this covers about 80 percent of all of our customer requests that we see on a day-by-day -day basis so you know predictive maintenance applications more generally condition monitoring monitoring the how something is doing, how its settings are. That's a really common thing with using sensors as well as like electric current consumption, some audio and computer vision. And one of the areas where this is very popular it is white goods. So we do see white goods cases on predictive maintenance. How do I measure the, the weight of the laundry? How do I um, tell when the, micro the microwave isn't working very well or when it needs to be cleaned? How do I tell when somebody has the, the stove set up in an optimal way? This kind of predictive maintenance issues, maybe even safety issues are, are becoming really common. It's a little bit of the, what you don't see as a consumer that goes into these smart products. Um, on the other end of this, we are seeing asset tracking and monitoring in buildings. So we are seeing kind of occupancy detection becoming a bigger and bigger thing partly in like commercial spaces where people are shopping and you want to understand shopper behavior and partly in um, back to work, right? Occupancy detection in buildings is becoming really interesting from a, is it safe to return to work? How many people do you have using spaces? Um, what's the, are there potential threats of, of um, infection because of misuse of spaces? All these things are really interesting for companies at the moment, so that's a big area. And that is a lot of different types of computer vision. I think the radar stuff's really, really cool for that too. And then the final area where we see a ton of activity is um, wearable devices for kind of high-end health and even professional health, right? People who are um, needing to know about their health uh, for their job, or for example, in post-surgery outpatient recovery monitoring, elderly care, things like this. We're seeing a lot of activity with tiny amount on wearables. And that's not only things like motion, right? It's also gestures sometimes interacting with the things as well as um, human biosensors, e ECG, EEG even, 
uh, skin temperature that are being monitored and processed for tiny amount. So those are a few areas that we've seen that 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 are, are very strong in the smart home and in um and in um, wearable type devices. Now one one customer case that we've we've seen and worked on is in the wearable space. Um, we've worked on a customer case for a wearable um, manufacturer who had issues with algorithm development, right? Most algorithms in the world today are kind of handcrafted. We don't really use ML to create algorithms in most products yet. A lot of companies talk about AI. Very few companies actually use AI, machine, real machine learning in production on their devices. They use it in bits and places here and there. Um, but this, this um, wearable manufacturer wanted to really revolutionize the way they do algorithm design. So go from a handcrafted algorithm that could take years to develop, for example, in sleep health, and move to more of a data-driven approach, right? C collect real data from how people are sleeping, right? Collect data from the laboratory, um, from lots of different sensors. And um, we saw that the, the really game-changing thing that affected these, these companies wasn't so much about running the algorithm on the wearable device. Yes, that's something we need to do eventually. But the game changer was the ability to use data to drive the whole innovation process, right? Gather all that data, use that sensor data to drive new algorithm development. So we saw like a, 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 a going from several years to make a new algorithm, we saw this go down to a few months even to make an entire new sleep algorithm or things like COVID flu detection was something that the team worked on and many more. So opening up the data to drive development of, of new things, I think that's really the game changer that we're talking about here. And then of course, we need to be able to deploy those algorithms in the right spot, right? Whether it is in the device, in a gateway, possibly in a smart home or even on the app, that's sometimes an appropriate place to deploy something. And that, that points to a challenge that I think companies who do this will start to have. Um, so many companies, when they call me, they talk about their machine learning. We use machine learning to develop this feature. It's amazing. Um, what they're actually talking about is they've used some sort of machine learning to develop an algorithm, but that algorithm stays static through the life of the product or maybe gets updated every year or so. There are very few products out on the market that are actually learning from my individual environment, despite despite the the hype. Um, and I can tell you, as a, I have one. I have a device called the Fin, and it is measuring water consumption in my home. And it is actually every week it gets better and better because that's when they update the algorithm about my particular home. And that sort of thing, though, is is difficult and that's not really tiny ml that's just ml broadly uh, but you know it's if you're trying to develop something like this i think the goal should be to get to this but i don't know if you'll be able to get through to the customer about how revolutionary it is until they actually see it in action i guess it's a very subtle point <laughs> As long as you are really updating this thing in real time and continuously improving it, I think that's a great DevOps point about ML, right? That this isn't static stuff. And I, we, we've seen that problem too. Like customers will come and think this is just a little bit like software. You just write it, it's done, leave it there. But, but how well did that work for IoT, to be honest, right? The static stuff that just got forgotten for 10 years, that's a security risk. We don't want to see that. Um, and in, in data-driven ML algorithms, it's even bigger, right? Because you can have drift, right? Your sensors can drift, your environment can drift, the user's um, usage patterns can drift. And so you really have to stay on top of a continuous improvement cycle with your ML algorithms. This is not just to develop once and deploy and forget. It's a maybe deploy, yeah, in the extreme case, every week. Start to use your customer's data to improve the algorithm. It's like the holy grail. And you probably, not for consumers, because I'll just reset it, but you should think about, I hate to say it, life cycle management for your algorithms. Because mm -hmm. like, for example, I labeled my data. I am a bad user. I labeled my data incorrectly and that screwed up everything. It's still screwing it up. And the only solution for me, because I couldn't roll it back, was just to reset everything. But in an industrial setting or with a client who is, you know, bigger, 
doing more than just measuring, you know, water throughout their home, maybe that's not an option. So you kind of want to be thinking about that when you're doing this. Do we want to talk about healthcare in more depth? I think we should. I think we should more broadly because I think that human health and in your home and, and, and on the move, I think is becoming a bigger and bigger thing, right? And technology is opening up people's health data to themselves and to others in a big way. And I, I think machine learning and tiny ML will play a big role there, right? It's got a very big role to play. Um, what is your view on this space? So I feel that healthcare is one of the you could drive so much innovation because HIPAA is already in place. Like we're already worried about our healthcare data. People mm -hmm. don't want it leaving anything. So, and there's so much opportunity to analyze and develop. I have four different sleep trackers, y'all, and they all measure my sleep slightly differently. I have no idea which ones. So, so there's no, there, there's so much room for innovation there. Um, and if you think about something like sleep tracking, this goes back to my closed loop system maybe, but if you know that I've slept poorly, maybe it's worth it to, to move my alarm if that's possible. Like maybe I don't have an alarm, but maybe it's worth it to, to keep the shades down a little longer or something like that. So I, I, I think about that. And then also related to privacy, the interest that we're having in figuring out different biomarkers that matter for disease detection is astronomical and everybody has one. So, and there's gonna, the FDA is going to get involved, is involved. So there's gonna be trials and such there, but right now it's such a cool open field. You could really innovate around anything. Do you see ML playing a role in biomarker usage combined Shh. with maybe the results of what kind of impact yeah. does that have? Do, do I sleep differently than you because of my genetics? Maybe. Maybe. I mean, it doesn't have to be high. The beauty of healthcare is it doesn't have to be hyper personalized because we're, we're really not quite there yet. I'll be honest, but like even something as simple as a new metric for measuring. I just saw FDA approval on a device that you strap to your arm. It is using LEDs to measure coagulation and it is a COVID detector that is right. 98.6% of the time in a hospital setting and 94% of the time in a, like a school setting. And it's a five minute thing. You strap it onto someone, it measures this. And then, so that that's battery powered. It's, it, that's a perfect use case for something like that. I think, um, and there's, we don't even know how many options, I mean, how many opportunities there are to measure some sort of different system that has, maybe it's not causative, but maybe it's highly correlated results. So we're, we're seeing the same in, in, in traditional areas like diabetes care, for example, there, there is a lot of innovation happening. Um, there are new forms of, of glucose monitors that are using kind of micro nano needles rather than deep needle as a patch. And you can use machine learning to affect that, um, how you're reading that, what, what it means. It's really interesting. Um, I know the founder of a, a company that did um, activity detection on, on low power watches. This could be done in a band, for example, uh, for eating behaviors for diabetes care. So nice. determining very precise eating behaviors. This was a company called Clue. Um, and Clue was acquired by Medtronic to build that, you know, deeper into um, the care of diabetes, you know, end to end. So that, that's also getting very interesting from an innovation and, and startup ecosystem. And, and yeah, your point that HIPAA is in place is maybe more of an opportunity than a threat. I think a lot of people shy away from um, FDA approved or FDA um, covered devices because they think it will be difficult or, or impossible because of regulations, but maybe in some way, Regulations like HIPAA actually help us provide a framework um, to be able to deal with these devices. And if you're interested in this and building these sorts of tools, there's an organization called uh, DIME, uh, Digital Medicine Society, and they actually do research on all of the medical devices that are out there and they're working with the FDA and they're trying to create clinical studies and ways for physicians to like prescribe things. So it's a really good resource for A, what's out there, and B, like what kind of rules and to lobby for things. Um, so that's that. Um, oh, you said Great. something. We, we have one more uh, 
point from the audience. We'll bring that up. That's great. Yeah. Thanks, everybody, for being active. Um, <laughs> so from Zoltan, he's pointing out that um, he is using computer vision for real-time fever detection in a project. That's really cool. So we have a, we have a project where um, we're using computer vision to, to tell um, fever detection. That's really cool. Um, in real time. I'm just looking at, at the page here. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna take a, a copy of the video URL here from the page and send it to the to the chat for everyone if somebody wants to check out that that application for 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 computer vision. Very neat. Um any other questions for folks? I we'd love to open up um also for audio. You can go off mute, ask us a question, we're happy to talk about it. Um, or feel free to use the chat. Yeah, we've we've covered a lot of things here. <laughs> and you can disagree with us too. Oh yeah. <laughs> People disagree with me all the time. Now, Jenny, I'm gonna count on you first. You always have good questions. Yes. Um... <laughs> Uh, yeah, Zach, I'm here, and actually I, I'm doing a bit of multitasking. That's where Tiny Mel would help. And hi, Stacy. Hello. Uh, re yeah, really enjoying your your podcast and and all all the things you've done in the past many years on on AI and IoT. I mean, it's, it's really remarkable. I mean, you're you're the the wisdom of of knowledge in this space. No, I think um, kind of uh, when I saw your your uh, slide, you showed. Uh, um five minutes ago or so Zach on these three categories kind of by, by, based on the customers I mean those are really really very broad very big groups with with, with with a lot of potential impact there how do you do I, I was thinking how do we community kind of to do a better job connecting connecting what we have today and I mean we saw this I mean it's kind of uh, the the number of companies and the number of tools and, and the hardware companies everything is like growing like big time right these technologies are going to be hugely mm -hmm. available so how do, how do we connect these technologies to those so uh, mark i mean you obviously talk to your customers right it's, really and, 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 it's, a, it's a big that's the hard part of this right building a community and building technology is kind of the part that we do pretty good pretty good job at right as engineers and companies um and in, in, in the media and journalism, right, we, we do a good job with that. But sometimes getting the technology to the application and user, right. Right. we're right. good at, right? And I, I think there isn't a magic way to solve that problem. It requires us that provide low-level technologies. That's like what I focus on is providing the building blocks for people. Yeah. I have to do a better job identifying those areas. That's why we did that work to kind of look through all the, the customer opportunities and figure out where are the focus areas because we can't right. do everything really well and so my approach is um there's a there's a kind of moore's um uh law to go to market which is you have to bridge the the gap in the market kind of one application at a time one vertical at a time you can't do all of them all at once you can't make everyone all happy so my approach is, you know, build the stack of things that people need to see how to use the technology. You don't always have to solve the complete end problem, but show them, here's the tutorial, here's the data set, here's the example, here's a white paper explaining the ROI, right, for this technology in this, this application. Um, here's an explanation of how the technology works in this space using their terminology. You kind of have to put all the little pieces in place that the the customer in that space will, will connect with right they'll understand what you mean and why you mean it because if we just talk about rnn and cnn algorithms on the most efficient um ai silicon with binary neural networks that's complete jargon for someone even in the smart home space particularly yeah. potentially right where they may not understand any of that and why that's important um and instead we probably have to talk about like we've been talking about with Stacy here, like what are some of the important things, right, that could be enabled, like privacy, um, because of the technology, and kind of like make it really easy and approachable for people. Yeah. So that's one. I think two. We need to see a lot of companies building vertical solutions, right, going all the way. Not everybody can build fundamental technology. It's hard to do it. It's hard to do it at scale. It requires tons of money. We need a lot of companies that go to the customer and say, "What is your problem?" 
great, we're going to solve that. And we're going to do it in a really innovative way with privacy. We're going to make use of the technology we have in the tiny ML community to do that in a really good way. Um, and that way they can make money a lot faster. They can go to market much more quickly because they're directly solving the problem. And, and with that, you just have to choose an application. You can't do all of tiny ML, right? Or all of the smart home. You've got to solve like the the voice activated back scratcher we were talking about, or the posture detector, you've got to solve that problem um, and do yeah. it really well. And then you can expand right to, to additional applications. No, definitely. And I think I really like the, the privacy point that Stacy made earlier, because to me, this is this could be a game changer because we are all humans. We are all analog creatures, right? And we are forced more and more to live in the digital world, like even now, right? We are kind of, I would rather have a beer with you, Doc, and you, with you, Stacey, or have lunch together, right? <laughs> and then chat rather than being in front of the screen. So I think I think the privacy aspect may be really kind of a, a big uh, deal breaker here, because by enabling privacy, we are allowing this kind of barrier for people to stay humans effectively, right? Not, not to be kind of fully digitized. And... Uh, I, I kind of forecast that um, people will be getting more sick and tired of kind of being more digital, 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 and, and privacy is going to be a huge setting point for us go back to kind of human roots, not, not the ones and zeros. And it's not just privacy. It's actually what you said going back away from digital. Um, the less, the, the smarter a device is intrinsically without being connected to the internet, but still can deliver that new experience, yeah. people will flock to that. Yeah, that's yeah. a great point. So we, no, we need I think that, that's a great... Go ahead. Yeah, we're we, we talking about augmentation here. Uh, not, 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 not so much taking away your identity. It's more like, how do you augment your, your senses? And how do you extend your day from 24 hours, maybe to more, because you can, these devices can do job for you, right? Mm -hmm. So that, 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 that's, that, that is actually a very important point too, definitely. I think we need a new model for the tiny ML foundation, tiny ML, bringing out your analog self. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's, I think that's a really good point. And, and, and privacy could end up being one of the killer features for this technology in the home and even in buildings, right? People are sensitive about their privacy, at least I am. I, I could see this um, being a killer, maybe combined with the ease of user experience, right? It always this works, right? Even if it's not connected to the internet, internet's down. Mm -hmm. I don't want my home to stop functioning when the internet doesn't work. That's well, not good. Privacy without giving up convenience and you know i heard someone called it task attainment which is the idea that you can you know sit on your couch and control your home right you're doing tasks but it's really more fun than any it's not that useful but if you think about most people are not going to give up a lot of privacy for for task attainment but they would you know employ these things if they didn't have to give that away so um yeah, and and I would also say for getting the word out, I think it's really important to understand that normal people, even very savvy people in the various industries, the VPs of innovation that, that I talk to, they're aware this exists. They have no idea how limited it is. You know, when you start talking about pruning models, they're just like, Ugh. and <laughs> if you come to them with a generic enough use case that they could think about applying at other places. And so what I'm thinking is like, hey, we could do wake work detection. How could you use personalized voice or personalized capacitive touch or personalized heart rate monitoring? So think big use cases and spread them out to those people. That's a really good way to like get them excited and tell you what they might want to do. Yeah, and I think space additionally, there is a very strong um, bottoms up component here because you're talking about the top down, right? The executive designing their product roadmaps and these kind of things. But once we enable these innovators, like what we're doing now with the vision challenge and the K 12 education and high students, high school students, and all these guys with. We are going to see a lot of innovations coming from the bottom. And I think that's what we are going to see in new Ubers and new companies like this. People really, I mean, Uber, you think about Uber, that's a very basic technology. It's GPS plus a smartphone, right? That's it. And GPS was like, what, 30 years old? And then smartphone was, what, 15 years old? And it, it enabled this huge 
new social economy thing. So again, once we give it to people, or, or Airbnb, right? It's like, it's like remember how all this company started. It's like from very basic stuff solving very basic problems. So I think I'm I'm really hopeful and excited about this bottoms up type of innovations coming in this space. I'll, I'll give a good example of that in healthcare. Um, and then we have a question from the audience I'll get to next. So we had a member of our developer community, 18 years old in, in India, um, took tiny amount, took some of our tools and created an open ECG patient monitor for Indian hospitals struggling with COVID load. Open source. Um, that does real-time AFib detection and real-time COVID stress detection. 18. It's amazing, right? And is deploying this in the local hospital where there's less regulation than we have with the FDA in the US, um, but solving a local problem, right? With the technology at hand, um, thanks to the community. I think we're gonna see a lot more of this kind of innovation, um, people solving problems very specific to their, to their local community. So uh, a question from Glenn um, from the audience, uh, in terms of finding the on-ramp for learning and applying TinyML, are there open community-based projects for newbies um, that can get involved? Um, or, for example, a TinyML for good open project repository? That, that's a really cool question. So, so two pointers I can give you. One, um, Hackster.io. I think Hackster.io is an awesome open project community. So on Hackster.io, you can find tons of TinyML projects. Um, there's been a bunch of challenges there and a bunch of other um, just developers sharing their projects with each other. And those are mostly open projects. So those projects are things that um, you can go to and, and they'll give you the source code. They'll tell you how they did it. They might even share their project. So I'll share the link for that. That's Hackster. Um, the other thing I can share with you is that we recently put together a free course on Coursera together with the TinyML Foundation, ARM, um, Arduino, to help make it really easy for normal developers to learn about using TinyML to, to solve problems. So not requiring you to become a data scientist or an ML researcher, but really practical. Here's how this works. Here's how you can use it. Here's how you can build your own projects. And I'll, I'll share the, the link for that Coursera course. It's called Introduction to Embedded Machine Learning. Um, there. So feel free to, to Take that Coursera course. We're hearing from Zoltan on the list that the Coursera course was excellent. That's great to hear. Um, Sean Heimel, who we worked with to make that course, awesome course instructor, really, really great speaker. Um, so I'm glad to hear that people like it. So there's a couple tips for getting started if you're new to the space. Um, yeah, any final questions um, from the audience before we wrap up? We, we might wrap up a little bit early, give you some of your time back. It's already been a, a fascinating discussion with Stacey. We should do this once a week to get people's um, ideas flowing. So many ideas. Um, I did get a question from uh, Glenn, and he actually wanted to know about the big tech companies getting involved and what, how Ooh. they might change the competitive landscape and close the pipeline to, you know, available tiny ML models or making it difficult to like deploy to Azure and AWS or it, things like that. So I don't know, Josh, if you have a, a Josh, sorry, I don't know, Zach, if you have yeah. thoughts on how this may play out. Yeah, so, I mean, we, it's always a double-edged sword, right? Like we see big cloud players get involved and support something and that can make it very accessible, but it's exactly what you pointed out, right? Which is that it could also lock it down that it's not very accessible across different platforms, right? You can you can get this kind of lock in. We're not seeing that um, at the moment. Like we are seeing very open data science technology source code projects like TensorFlow or Cafe or PyTorch being really widely supported by Google and Amazon and Microsoft and Apple. And, and I think that's really healthy, right? And I, I think the reason for that, it was in one of our breakouts earlier this week that that benefits them too, right? There's so much research happening. There's so much happening at a university level with new innovations, new operators, new architectures for ML that the big cloud players can't keep up with that. And for them to keep up with that, they need to be part of that community. They need to be open to contributions from the academic community and vice versa. So 
that's served as a really good, like common platform for research. And I, I think that's going to just continue in ML. So, so I don't see them kind of like getting into like closed platforms for this stuff. Um, at the same time, right, most of the tooling for data science is aimed at data scientists, right? Like we, we're seeing the tools from, from the cloud vendors be data science tools, right? Oh, here's a notebook. Oh, great. You want to play with a notebook. Um, I don't really see them caring that much about the embedded world. We, we've always seen a, it's a very difficult jump to go from the cloud world to embedded. We've seen it with IoT, right? We have, you know, different kinds of connectors and different kinds of OSs from different cloud vendors. But they have a real hard time doing that across lots of hardware. Um, and so I, I at least see the, the, the tiny email community being very driven by the open source projects, driven by the developer tooling that we provide for this that is hopefully open and really easily accessible for people. And I, and I do see that's how it plays out in the future. I don't think we're going to see like a, a lock-in with Cloud Vendor A or Cloud Vendor B. Great. Any awesome. final questions for, for Stacey or I um, or for the audience? Uh, we have one that's come in. Um, but if I have to post my model through the App Store, if I want to use the Apple Watch, that is a good point. Yeah. <coughs> We are going to have consumer lock-in for products. I don't think we're going to we're going to see that go away with app stores, et cetera. So we do see the the uh, the Apple Store <clears throat> being its own environment, and the and the Android um, Google Play Store being its own environment, et cetera. And that's fragmenting somewhat with the Chinese manufacturers. In the in the mobile world, I don't think that's going to go away. But but we can use the same technology to deploy models on those devices, like. For example, WebAssembly packages really easily be built into many of those devices. You can even run them on browser-based um, applications on phones. That gives you some independence. So I don't think that's going to lock us into a particular model type. It's not going to change the way we develop ML because of those devices. But you're right. To get it in the app, you probably have to go through some app store. Or, like Stacy said, just remove the apps completely and build the feature into your device, right? So you don't necessarily have to go install an app for this. Yeah, consumers aren't going to buy based on models. Like like I said, like tra tracking four different sleep, tra I can't tell. I'm going to buy a product based on cost, you know, the other features it offers, that sort of thing. So, so yeah. Great. Hey, Stacy, huge thanks for joining us. Um, Thank talk you. Talk about this. Um, really exciting stuff. I've learned a lot as well um, through the conversation. Uh, thanks to the, the whole um, group and community that's followed us today. Um, we're also going to be posting uh, the video from the session live to the whole Tiny Mail community. We have about 5,000 people who follow the event, so this will be available um, afterwards as well. And as always, you know, feel free to reach out to us um, separately through online channels, etc. if you have additional questions or points. And make sure to follow um, Stacy on IoT, the newsletter. Um, podcast videos. Stacey has a lot of great content and events coming up. Awesome. Well, thank you, Zach. And yeah. Thanks, everybody. We're going to wrap up, give you a few minutes back. Uh, again, just a quick uh, shout out to our sponsors. Bear with me for one minute. We have different categories. We have executive sponsors, first one being ARM. Then we have Qualcomm. We have Samsung, Platinum Sponsors, Ada Compute, Lattice Semiconductor, Gold Sponsors, Brainchip, Babel Labs, DSP Group, Edge Impulse, Emza, Gray Matter Labs, Green Waves, Hymax, 
Imagimob, Latent AI, Maxim Integrated, Quixel, Reality AI, SenseML, Silicon Labs, Sentient, Google TensorFlow, Xmos, and lastly, Silver Sponsors, Edge Cortex, Hachi, and Synsense.